Each of us has um, emotions and, and values about uh, politics, what we like and don't like. And in many cases, those are really uh, passionately held. We have very specific individual preferences. And the contribution of political science, why we study political science, is so that we can get a detached view of those political preferences. So we can use them to explain, to understand the political world um, that, we, uh, that we confront without taking a position on that. It's a science. Political science is a science. And a science has um, a focus on, on, two, uh, on one concept, two words in particular, um, and that is disconfirmable knowledge. Disconfirmable knowledge. Is it possible to describe and understand the political world um, objectively? So that a description of the political world will be um, as convincing, as plausible, to a liberal as to a conservative, to someone on the far left as on um, the far right. That's the hope and promise of political science. It's about gaining a clear understanding of the political world. So we're going to seek knowledge and help you um, think of ways of acquiring and assessing that knowledge in a detached and, and even-handed way. And then we're going to use that knowledge in order to confirm or disconfirm priors that we may have, prior beliefs or prior hypotheses, which is the word we typically use when we talk about science. So today we're going to talk about ideology, political ideology, that is how, um, how people, um, what, the, the kind of underlying ideas and ideals that people use in order to understand the world. So ideology can help us understand how people come to decisions, why they vote for a certain party or not, and how the choices that political parties offer, how we can understand these. So an ideology is a way of simplifying the world. It's a more or less coherent set of ideas and ideals. Ideas about how the world works, and ideals about how we would like the world to work. And, to work. and ideology is easier than just keeping all these thousands of issues in our head, and instead we can use or we use ideology to come to a relatively quick assessments of where we stand on a number of issues. Yes, and the idea of an ideology is it produces coherence and therefore understanding. So if I know your position on one particular issue, like lowering taxes for richer people, I can get a fair idea of where you'd stand on a variety of other issues, like, for example, um, whether government should subsidise health care or whether the minimum wage should be increased. It's not a perfect fit, but in general, if you know where a person stands on one of those issues, you have a pretty good idea of predicting where they would stand um, on uh, another issue. So think about it. Ideology makes choice um, possible. Imagine that there, were, there are literally hundreds of issues that you can take um, positions on. And imagine a world in which political candidates were articulating positions on each of those issues. How on earth would you ever be able to select a candidate across hundreds of issues where you'd have some disagreements and some, um, some agreements? So ideology makes a choice possible. It makes it possible to have a democratic political system because you can choose people based on the ideology, the set of coherent positions that a person um, articulates. So ideology bundles issues. So one um, bundle that, that is very commonly used and the dominant one is bundling of economic issues. And on economic issues you might take a position on the left or a position on the right, economic, and, and this, these are issues that have to do with how much the state should intervene in the economy, how much should we care about equality of opportunities or equality of outcomes for people, how much should we care for freedom, market freedom, economic freedom. So positions on the left will lead one to think of emphasizing the role of the state, emphasizing the role of equality, emphasizing the role of equality of outcomes as well as of opportunity. While positions on the right 
would precisely emphasize the other elements, the role of the market, the role of economic freedom. And even if that means a fair amount of inequality in both opportunities and outcome in, in our society. So let's look at a, a bundle of these concrete issues. For example, how progressive should taxation be? Should the government ensure access to health care? And at what price? Should the government um, be responsible for mass transport? Should it make mass transport transport available to most of us? Should government make education affordable for all? These are all issues that we typically think of as primarily economic issues. Issues that motivate a dimension an, of competition a, a, and set of ideologies that have to do with economic uh, issues from economic left to economic right. So these were the dominant issues in the past decades, or let's say the first four decades after World War II. Yes, I mean it's it's interesting that the left-right was so predominant actually in the mm -hmm. years when, in our, in our childhood really. Yes. And um, it's an interesting situation, you know, why was it the economic that so was so predominant in, in, in political uh, debates, in the uh, choices that people made across political uh, parties? And I think it has to do very much with the effects of World War II. And mm -hmm. the first effect was that you couldn't engage um, ethnicity. That nationalism, um, patriotism was fine, but nationalism was viewed as a path to um, destruction. So you took out a whole series of possible issues that were very predominant in the before World War I and, and, and after World War I that just didn't seem legitimate anymore for elites for those who are contesting power to, um, uh, to raise. Remember, we're talking here mostly about Europe, right? European politics, and Europe had been one of the two major theatres, if that's the appropriate word, where this world war had been waged, right? And, and 60 million people lost their lives, and there were physical, physical memories of this throughout Europe. Yes, and the, the challenge for Europe um, and actually for most countries across the world, was rebe rebuilding their societies um, after the destruction um, of, uh, of World War II. If you see those photographs of the destruction of so many cities through bombing, mm. um, they, were, they were turned into rubble. And so the chief uh, challenge of those societies after World War II was uh, gaining prosperity, gaining stability, political stability and um, prosperity. And so the debate was about how you do that and what is the role of government in that? What's the role of government in, in planning? Uh, what's the role of government in trying to support um, industry? What should the distribution of the rewards be? Who should get what in that uh, rebuilding um, process? And that's precisely the, uh, the core issue of the left-right. And that's what's the role of the government in the market? What's the role of individual freedom? What's the role of the government in trying to um, provide a safety net um, for individuals who couldn't make it by market um, behaviour, market activity? Well, that's one world. That's the world of the economic left-right. And as we're going to suggest, it's not the only dimension that you can describe in terms of getting a, a leverage, getting an insight into individuals' uh, ideology and the ideology of political parties and candidates when they are contesting, when they're trying to gain people's votes in order to um, create a government and sustain a government. There's another dimension that we wish uh, to uh, discuss and, um, and it's a social dimension. And um, what were the origins of that um, social dimension? And I know you have a a kind of a, um, um, uh, a story that um, reflects on this. Um, well, what was going on after um, World War II? What was the change in the 1970s and 1980s that brought about a social um, left-right? We can still call it left-right, but it's not about the role of the government in the economy. It's not about equality. It's um, economic equality. It's not about economic freedom. And 
um, there were certain things that were going on in terms of, say, generational change. And that is, you had a, a generation that was born after World War II that had experienced some relative prosperity, some relative so affluence. In a way, it was, the, it was the very success of the first yeah. few decades after World War II when the factories were running uh, at full speed, where the economy was, by the 1960s, early 1970s, thriving in many ways. And particularly, I mean, if I go back, you ask me to talk about my, you know, I was born in Belgium, um, that small country, country in, the, in the center of Europe. And I grew up in a, a small, relatively rural village. My parents were farmers, um, both left school my father at 13, my mother at 15, that's how things were these days. And uh, they were working very hard and the first f few decades were very, very tough. But by the 1960s, 70s, they, as well as um, most people, in, in, in certainly in Western Europe, were, were recovering and the economy was doing very well. And in a time span of just a decade or two, the world I grew up in as a child, and the world I became a young woman um, were very different worlds. I grew up in a village where essentially the power was, as I said, it's a rural village, the power was in the hands of three people. It was um, the doctor, who was the one educated person. It was the priest, because this is Belgian Catholicism, who was the, the, the moral authority in the small village. We all went to church every week. And it was the baron, because we had a, in aristocrat, we had a castle. In fact, we lived uh, in the shadow of the castle, and my parents uh, leased land from the aristocrat. They didn't own the land, they just uh, paid rent um, on an annual basis. That was the world I grew up with, in a, a very slow-moving, very deferential world, where we knew who was on top and who was... Um, not on top, but by the time I was ready to leave high school, that world had totally disappeared. So a decade and a half later, the doctor no longer was there. He was replaced by a female doctor. The, um, the priest was no longer there because the church could not maintain, because very few people went to church weekly anymore. And the aristocrat, his his major estate had been transformed into a leisure park. The world had changed. So had I. I was, um, and I think it's the same for you, I was probably the first in my family to finish high school, almost the first, and certainly the first one to go to university. Uh, and it was probably thanks to my mother's insistence. My mother always told me later, I uh, always wanted to go and study and become a nurse, but she was told by the people around her, that that was not a appropriate thing, proper thing to do for a woman. And so she had to leave school and, and become a, farmer, a farmer's wife. But she was intent that her two daughters would not have to make that sacrifice, as she mentioned. And so we, um, we were able to finish school. We went to the city school um, early to, in order to prepare to go to university. But also the last thing I want to say about this I was one of those lucky few who could uh, benefit from these opportunities that opened up to our societies yes. in the 60s and 70s yeah. and 1980s. But very many did not. If I, I mean, if I think of the people I went to school with um, in the village school in my childhood, I can't think of any of my friends then who had the same path. Most, most stayed in the village and still are in the village live there as of today. Hmm. I mean, look, it, it points to something about, about Europe that does distinguish Europe from America, and that's the rootedness of individuals in, um, in, in Europe. Yeah. And there is that um, lovely story of the uh, skeleton that was found in Wales, 9,000-year-old skeleton, and they checked people who, you know, is there anybody who's related to this, uh, to the, the person that was, that has become the skeleton? And it so turned out that the local school teacher was a direct descendant. <laughs> 9,000 years in the same village. That is Europe vis-a-vis vis vis America. Um, but the general story that you're telling is one of, 
of generational change and the, yes. and the development of mass education. Yes. And I too was somebody, I was the first person in my family who was educated past, I suppose, the, the age of 14. And so mass education opened up and there were these new issues on the, um, on the table. And one of them was um, equal opportunities for women. Yes. And the rise of, of women's liberation later, but this was something that was, was kind of boiling up really from the bottom, for, from, the, from, the 19, from the 1960s and particularly the 70s, and then the issue of, um, of the environment yes, and the sustainability of the, of the environment. So remember, it's, um, much of the energy in the first few decades had been about creating economic growth at almost any cost, breakneck speed, to bring the destroyed societies back to a level and then move on from there. And in the 19... 60s and particularly in the 1970s, reports came out, scientific studies, that the resources on Earth were not unlimited. Yes. Okay. So we were. Um, uh, this is a, uh, also the. It's an intellectual kind of biography yeah. in the sense that we were aware, as many other people are were, that the economic left right didn't contain, didn't encapsulate the issues that really mattered um, to people. This is also a time of transnationalism where the barriers across countries were, were getting lowered. And this led to trade, but not just to trade, but to large numbers of, of immigrants, particularly in European um, societies, um, also in the United States. And so there were a variety of social issues that came onto the um, agenda. And what we were thinking is, well, they do kind of hang um, together. There's a social left-right as well as an economic left-right. And while these social issues having to do with the environment, um, having to do with women's rights and a variety of issues, uh, choice, having to do with individual choice and the, the role of women in the society, um, while there were different issues, they did, you could predict to some extent how a person stood on one of these issues if you knew their position on another they really came to be part of a kind of a dimension that held together like um, an ideology. But had, was very often independent of the economic left-right. That is, you could be someone who was economically left, um, wanting a, a strong role for the government in regulating the economy, say, or just, um, say, progressive taxes. But at the same time, you could be someone who's either socially left or socially right, someone who is very much in favour of, of um, women's rights or someone who is much more traditional and wants to maintain you know, a strong role for the traditional family in, in, personal, in, in one's village, in one's environment. Absolutely. So two people, imagine that two people who have very similar views on the economic left-right. Let's say they believe in free markets. Yeah. And that's uh, so to the to the right, they have less emphasis on um, equality. They can have very different views on gender or gay marriage or the environment or, or, or race. And so there's this second dimension that we want to bring into, into play. And we had specific names for that. And those names are kind of caught on in our, in our fields. And those names are, are as follows. On the left, on the social left, it's GAL, Green Alternative Libertarian. And on the right, it's TAN, T-A-N, traditional authority nationalism. So you can imagine that's on the social right. So these are two composite terms because the issues are not quite as, as lined up in exactly the same way as, uh, as on the economic left-right. But they really do, um, they really do hang um, together. One is how socially... Um, liberal, how open-minded, how open or flexible an individual is, how focused on individual choice that individual's preferences um, are, and on the other side it's more conservative, more commu uh, community norms oriented, more government intervention actually in people's personal um, personal lives. So maybe this, this is a good time to, to think about some concrete issues that, that load on this dimension, as we would say in scientific language. So how much protection of the environment? I mean, how should you balance that vis-a-vis -vis 
maximizing economic growth. Should government regulate um, citizens' morality, for example, in the, um, in the bedroom? Should sexual minorities um, have the same rights, for example, in terms of marriage, in terms of um, inheritance, as others do? Should government um, decide life and death issues? Should, um, should government impose the death penalty? Should government impose rules about um, women's right to have um, abortion? Yeah. Should it be a government's or community right, or should it be an individual choice? Should right. um, the government decide when a person couldn't take their own life if they're seriously ill? Euthanasia. Yeah. And then perhaps the biggest question of all, um, who belongs to our community? Who is one of us? And who is... A stranger. Who do we want to have in our community? So, we are often used in, in American politics to think about a single dimension from liberal to conservative. And that's certainly a way of simplifying the political world. That's what ideologies are all about, remember. But what we've tried to show you is that if you do that, you, you lose a lot of the uh, important distinctions that make politics today. And most importantly, you lose the distinction between a dimension that is mostly about economic issues, the economic left, economic right, and a second dimension, a younger dimension, or the one that is currently gaining salience, becoming more important, and that is, a, that is one that leads from GAL, Green Alternative Libertarian, to turn traditional authority, nationalism. And that's an, a, a dimension that has to do with cultural and social issues. So on the, uh, on the, on the PowerPoint on the screen um, in front of you um, are two ways of conceiving the ideology of individuals and uh, political parties and candidates. And on the left, that you, you see this single dimension, the left-right, and then on the right you see this double dimension, this slightly more complicated but actually essentially quite simple space of an economic left-right and then a social left-right which we call um, Gal, um, Galtan. And um, very interestingly, you can actually, it makes sense uh, to have, um, you can have issues in each one of these quadrants on the slide that you uh, now see. So economic left and Gal, okay, fine, we know um, candidates and political parties. This is actually where most people in the Democratic Party would now be uh, placed. They're both gal and economic left. Um, um, and then um, on the bottom right-hand quadrant, you are economically right and tan, and that's where most Republicans um, today would be uh, located. But those are not the only um, locations that are um, coherent in terms of their ideology. So think of, think of the top right quadrant. Can people think of a, yeah. of a possibility there? Yeah, think of that. Just think of it for a moment. You can press pause. Um, so where would you, uh, who are the individuals or candidates or political parties that would be both gal and economic right? And how would they call themselves? You know, what, what, is, what would be the label that they use? What is the ideology they would prescribe to? Right, well, if you thought of the term libertarian, well done. That's exactly what was in our minds. Yeah. Um, in Europe, these would be liberal parties. So there we've got an interesting difference in nomenclature. That is, you know, if you're a liberal in the United States, you're gal and economic left. But if you're a liberal in Europe, you can be on the economic, uh, on the economic right. In fact, most liberals would be. They would be, Europe, indeed. Yeah. They would be, indeed. Yeah. And um, that's actually... The result, the, the cause of that contrast in, in, in terms between, you might say, English and American English, two uh, countries divided by a common language, one <laughs> says, um, um, is that um, the term liberal did a somersault in the United States around the decades around the turn of the century. If you know your kind of American ideology, it would be Herbert Crowley who'd be one of the people associated um, with that. But anyway, there is this... Was he reading backwards? Um, he was actually uh, thinking about the way in which...
um, liberals should actually refer to that um, um, top left quadrant. Uh -huh. um, so he moved this term um, across. It just became common um, in, the U in the United States. Um, and then also, I mean, you can be on the bottom left quadrant. Economic left and tan. Now, give a moment. That's a bit, um, a bit more tricky to think of parties there because today there are so few who are economically left and, and tan. So you've got to go back a little bit in, in history, not so far back, but back in history, to think of an example of a, uh, a party or a government, indeed, that will be economically left and um, tan. I'll give you a moment to, uh, to consider that. Press pause if you desire. We've introduced a way of, of orienting um, individual preferences and, and party preferences across these two uh, dimensions. And what we have done over the past 20 years or more now is, ha is um, achieving real data on political parties right across Europe and beyond in 32 countries, including the United States, and now including um, Latin America, um, where we ask um, experts on political parties, where would you place that party on the economic left-right, on Galtan and on other issues besides. Um, in this frame that we've uh, been sh um, showing you, and we're using hundreds of experts, there's over 400 experts, um, and we are then placing almost 300 political parties, there are a lot of political parties um, across Europe, and so we actually have a kind of a, a, a resource base, an informational base, on where parties stand ideologically on economic left-right and on a Galtan over an extended um, period of time. So you can use this data uh, in two ways. You can look on how parties have shifted over time. But here I'm showing you a picture of the most recent uh, election, the 2019 election in Europe. Uh, there's a um, Every five years, all Europeans go and vote for the European Parliament. This is what you get here. So what you see here, each of these dots is a party. And if you kind of look at where the individual party families, the kinds of parties, um, are located, how are they uh, dispersed across this, uh, this two-dimension uh, frame that we have, uh, this is what you get for the parties that are the, were the main parties until the 19. 80s and 1990s. And so what you see here on the left is a radical left. It's mostly Gal. A few of, a few of those um, radical left individuals who used to be communists could be put on the Tan side. And then next to them, the Social Democrats. Um, and then the Liberals, as we mentioned, who are both Gal and um, Tan. And under each one of these names, you see the percent that that party got in the European elections, elections right across the European Union, in which individuals vote for parties, and all the parties then are present in the European uh, Parliament, the second largest parliament in the world after the one in, uh, after Congress in, uh, in India. Yes. Um, so it's a very diverse, it's a mosaic of political parties, very interesting. You see, you see what Europeans across the board are electing in terms of their representatives. And then on the town side, the Christian Democrats, slightly right of center, and then the conservatives who are right of the uh, Christian Democrats. So the size of the circles gives you a sense of how diverse, internally diverse, yeah. these party families are. We literally talk about party family because these are political parties in different countries that share an ideology. So the notion of family refers to the fact that they have a similar ideology. So and so what you get, you know, the picture really describes it's diverse, you know, but where is most of the contestation? Well, it's mostly on the economic left-right. Sure, they vary across Galtan, but not nearly as much as the recent parties that have come into being in, in Europe. So this is the full picture now. You see two of two new party families that are, that emerge, Gal on the top in the top left corner, and Tan in the or the Gal and the Green Party family in the top left corner, and Tan parties in the 
sudden on the sudden uh, dimension there very yes. much in the south. Right. These are the youngest party families in Europe. These are also the parties that are most outspoken on the Gal Town dimension. And as you can see by the size and the shape of their circles, they are internally very diverse on the economic left right. The you know the Green parties tend to lean towards economic left, but not all. But the tan parties in particular are very diverse. Some of them are pretty um, egalitarian, but others are very much proponents of, of free markets. Yes. So on the economic left, right, tan parties are kind of all over the place. But where, you know, what really describes them, what do they really care about, what's their key issue, what's most salient to them? Well, that is being tan, being nationalist, uh, emphasizing authority or being authoritarian and then traditional uh, values. Well, next, let's have a little uh, discussion about um, what people can expect in the, in the next lecture. Exactly. So what we're going to be doing in the next lecture is just look at each of these party families and give you a bit more of an idea of what their ideologies consist of. What do these parties promise? And um, what, kind of, what kind of world view do they present to their electorate?